This discussion is called the cryptography panel, but really we're going to talk about all uses of security in order to help us to create a society, the society we want to live in. We've been talking a, uh, a bit today about uh, trust, and we've talked about security, of course, and privacy, and that will all weave into uses of cryptography, uh, trends in cryptography, and trends in security technology in general, and how it affects society and individuals. My name is Steve Hunt. I'm the director of the North Carolina Center for Cybersecurity Design and Innovation. And uh, I'm also um, a longtime um, active member at the board level and um, chapter levels of the ISSA, the Professional Association of Security. Um, I have uh, an esteemed panel here, and uh, uh, I'd like uh, Jason, Dave, and Karsten to introduce themselves really briefly, and we'll uh, jump into this conversation. And you're all invited to join in, shout out to questions and objections, just like we're all sitting in a, in a pub right now. Jason. Thank you. Um, my name is Jason Franklin. I have a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University uh, in computer security. Uh, I taught at Stanford University uh, in the computer science department, uh, security courses for uh, a number of years after that. And then when I realized that other people were better at uh, creating security technology, I, I switched over to investing uh, in smarter people uh, than myself. I'm Dave Mayer, uh, the CTO at InterTrust, and uh, I've been working in the security area for literally 40 years and uh, seen a lot of stuff. So I might talk about some of it, but uh, I'm, I'd really like to hear some of uh, your opinions as well. My name is Carsten Stöcker. I'm a physicist, still working for Innoji, which is a big European utility, spinning out my own project called Sphirity, and Sphirity is a uh, general purpose identity and digital twin platform um, giving back the value of the data to people and machines. Very good. We have a diverse panel here and it's even more diverse because you're all part of the panel. Let's talk about society for a moment. You know, when any group forms, high school cheerleaders, the Kiwanis Club, a corporation, the first question that's asked is, who are we? Who is us and who is not us? Who is us and who is them? Gentlemen, how does, and all of you, how does security technology help us to answer the question, who are we? All right. Well, so I, when I think about, um, you know, one of the preeminent uses of cryptography is, is this uh, assigning identity uh, and, and doing so in a way um, that's indel indelible uh, and difficult to forge. Uh, and so cryptography gives us, you know, the, the ability to identify ourselves in a way which is, you know, provably unforgeable uh, or, or you know, providing authentication information. So at least from a technical perspective. <laughs> All right. I, I would like to, to add, so us, or who, who am I, who are we? So it's basically our identity, it's a unique identifier, plus a huge amount of data. And today, what is linked to us, so we're basically giving all our data to Facebook, Google, and that's true for, uh, for, for people, but that's also true for machines, because if you think a machine of an entity, so the machines are also giving their data to GE, Predix, Siemens, Bosch, and that's us, so we give our data for free to someone else. Okay, but it's not all of our data. Right? It's not all of the information about us. It's only some subset of our information that applies to the role that we're talking about uh, in any specific situation. If I'm a member of a corporation, it's only the information about me that's relevant to that corporation. And same if I'm a high school cheerleader. Uh, it's only whether I pass tryouts or not. Well, the, uh, one of the issues is, is that there is a lot more data that's being connected, uh, collected about you than, than you can imagine, uh, any of us can imagine, even professionals, I think, are people who've been monitoring this. And um, one, to answer you know, part of your question is, is one of the things that we can do with cryptography is allow you to control your identity. Because somebody else, if they collect all this information about you and they have the power to represent you, they're going to define your identity, and you're not. So uh, part of the whole issue around privacy 
is directly connected to being able to control your identity, to be able to say, this is who I am, and these other people who've been collected all this data about me who claim to be authorities, they're wrong. I guess we do that whenever we, we have an application in our, in our corporation, like uh, email, it's hard for someone else, not, but not impossible for someone else to impersonate, impersonate me via email or through technology. If someone were to uh, take over my Facebook account, I guess they could, they could start to be me in some virtual way, but uh, it wouldn't be long before the system would notify me and we could fix it. Is that always the case? Can systems be so robust that we can always uh, defend or usually defend our identities? Uh, I, I don't think so. And, uh, and in fact, that's one of the uh, areas of, uh, of uh, the application of cryptography that a lot of us are working in. Uh, in the digital world, it's becoming a lot more difficult to determine what's real. You're merging uh, uh, cyber systems with physical systems. And uh, the things that we're seeing in, in what we're calling augmented reality uh, is uh, making it a little bit more difficult to sort out what is real. Uh, is that a real image of the president doing some odd thing or is that not? And uh, how can you trust uh, digital photos, uh, digital videos and things of that sort? Uh, people who are representing themselves as you to somebody else, uh, it, it, that's becoming easier and easier to do over time. And uh, uh, again, how, do, how can you control that and how can you as an individual trust what you're seeing with your own eyes? I think also the, I mean, the, the shift to cloud services has played into this immensely because we've given over a lot of the trust uh, that we would have had when doing kind of local computation to, you know, cloud service providers, right? And so that's where cryptography can help us capture uh, trust in these environments where we've effectively given over the computational, uh, you know, we, we've assigned the computational layers to a, a third party. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of new cryptographic techniques where we're splitting information, we're doing private computations, um, and, and we're able to protect our identity and some of our information even when we're computing on potentially untrusted uh, or third party infrastructure. I'm, I'm wrestling with all of this, uh, discussions of trust and security, and I think, I, think about, I think about security measures that I have around me. Uh, when I get in my car, I, we have uh, airbags and lights and mirrors and, and uh, seat belts and brakes, but why do we have brakes on a car? Why do we have brakes on a car? Why do we have brakes on a car? To, to stop. But if my intention were to stop, I would just not go anywhere in the first place. I think we have brakes on a car so we can drive fast. It gives us the freedom and the ability to drive fast. And so isn't that really what we're doing with these authentication technologies? It's not protecting. It's not avoiding risk. It's allowing us to thrive in the, uh, in the midst of risks. What do you think? Yeah, I fully agree because the combination of modern cryptography plus other technology innovations such as blockchain allows to build completely different systems. And today we are accelerating and giving away all our data. However, combination of modern technology blockchain allows to build completely entirely new systems where we control the data. And I would like to give an example. Steve, you and I, we meet on a decentralized Facebook platform. I have my data fully encrypted, fully under my control. Steve has his data fully encrypted, fully under his control. So we do a smart contract transaction, giving ourselves access to each other data. I think it's pretty secure, completely different system. And um, yeah, we can, we can have a social network transaction among each other. However, we don't need to give our data away to the Facebooks of the world, um, push all our data in, in corporate big data lakes and they are exploited by other third parties. And this is what modern cryptography, IT innovation, blockchain and the likes um, allow to build. Completely new systems with breaks included. 
where we as humans decide what's being done with our data, and if you would like to stop that Steve uses my data, I stop it, I destroy the, um, private key, uh, the, the, the keys used for this transaction, and then the transaction stops. It's entirely possible. Yeah, there's a question. Yeah, that's a, that's a, the precursor of, of, of actually sharing the data is uh, of, of uh, making that decision as to who you want to share the data also provides the context of when do you want to stop. Uh, and uh, you know, to follow on to this whole sort of analogy here regarding uh, do we have, uh, you know, where are the breaks and what context are we using them and things of that sort. Uh, if you take a, a look at the, the healthcare area, it's an area where, in, in my opinion, we've got the brakes on way too much all over the place uh, because we're not sharing enough information for the common good. And it's getting in the way of, uh, of progress in the medical field. And um, uh, we have really good reasons not to share information, say, with our insurance company, in many cases with our employers or with other people, even with your spouse in some cases. But uh, on the other hand, to be able to share information for the common good, you know, you know, through medical research, or just does this medication work in this person and not in that person, if we were able to collect a lot more information about it, it would be a lot better. So it, this, this uh, context of who we want to share information with, even on a massive scale, is, is, is something that, uh, that we have to uh, examine a lot better and see whether or not our technology can help us with that. I think that's one of the... With cryptography, I often look at it and say, is it an enabling technology? Is it making something, uh, making a new type of information sharing or information protection possible that was never done before? Uh, or is it something that's blocking uh, a behavior from occurring? And I think that's the most exciting aspect of crypto versus traditional computer security and system security, is that crypto often enables these fantastic new, you know, multi-party computation type schemes, which you, know, you couldn't even really imagine these things occurring without the mathematical properties that you get from some of these very advanced crypto systems. And so that's, I think crypto is a more enabling technology and can uh, help us, you know, operate in a fashion that we couldn't even imagine in the physical world necessarily. I would like to give an example. Yeah. So um, I think this was very abstract, but if you think about our wearables and some other personal data for med te med medical technology devices, today we push the um, iWatch data into Apple Clouds and we get a recommendation. So with modern cryptography, it's entirely possible that we store the data in a decentralized version of the internet. We have full control of the data. First, we can bring an algorithm on top of our data that's exactly providing the same recommendation Apple is um, providing without sharing the data with Apple. However, um, Jason, you mentioned this modern cryptography, you mentioned secure multi-party computation, or there are also zero-knowledge proof systems. What we can also do, we can push our encrypted data, let's say to healthcare company that is analyzing the wearable data, the DNA data, whatever it is, to invent new medications. So we, we share encrypted data, they run the algorithms on top of it, and even if they find something, we can build in a mechanism that for sharing our data, we get an incentive back, and this is all possible now with modern cryptography without surrendering our data to third parties. Just like in the formation of any so social group, uh, an aboriginal tribe or, uh, or uh, a corporation, uh, we have naturally migrated from the first question, which is who are we, to the next question, the next obvious question. Okay, here we are. What do we do? What's expected of us? What is proper behavior? What is allowed? What is disallowed? If we're, uh, if we're a member of a professional football team, there are certain expectations. You know, we show up for training camp a certain number of weeks ahead of the season. We, we perform our best in the, in the games. We, uh, but then there's, there are questions or challenges to acceptable behavior. Uh, even in a professional football team, for example, do we stand or take a knee at some point? And now here's a, here's a challenge to what is considered acceptable or appropriate behavior. Now, when we're talking about security systems, uh, 
we have to design applications and technology to allow for organizations to morph and adapt and change not just who we are, what defines who we are, but what defines acceptable behavior. What can security technologists do to help this discussion? To help us be flexible about uh, auth authorization controls? Well, the, um, uh, what, the, the word that you, you perhaps uh, are, are connecting to, at least from you know, the way I view things as a, uh, as a secure systems uh, person, is uh, policy. What policies do you allow? What, uh, what is acceptable or what is going to be uh, um, uh, uh, the behavior that uh, uh, will allow somebody to, to come into your door? Uh, a lot of those things are changing. We're getting things like, um, you know, uh, Amazon is in introducing a technology that's, uh, 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 it's not so much a technology, it's a, uh, uh, a system that says, uh, well, come in and put this stuff in your house and you won't even have to go out in the rain to, to, to pick things up. Uh, and um, that's a policy that you, as a human, need to ad adjust to. Uh, they're putting some new, you know, conditions in. So you, you've got to put a camera or something like that and you have to have a, an electronic door lock and things of that sort. Uh, but uh, a certain policy now that uh, is changing that you can't imagine that you would have done in the past, and, and technology is, is changing that. So new policies will emerge, and that's something that actually we're, we don't have a lot of technology deployed yet to do that. Um, and, and in fact, the issues of you know, who to rely on, and what, uh, which is you know, what the policy question is that you're talking about, is uh, still not easily uh, uh, addressed using any of our technologies yet. We're going to see it introduced simple, uh, in simple applications such as what, uh, uh, what Amazon was doing here. But on, on the other hand, we're going to be asked to rely on a lot of machines. And some people think machines are a lot more reliable than humans, and other people think the opposite. Mm -hmm. So uh, people's gonna, people are going to need to make their own decisions about policy in, in different contexts, and we don't know how to do that yet, I don't believe. Karsten, did you see a comment? Oh, yeah, we have a comment. Yeah. Who gets to decide the policy since we are now the group? In the group of the high school cheerleaders or the Kiwanis Club, there are you know, bylaws that, pre, you know, that precede us, pre precede us joining the group. But if we're some aboriginal tribe somewhere, we're going to uh, decide who is us first, and then we'll decide what's acceptable behavior based on uh, our goals. But the question of our goals is what you're asking. About how, do we, how do we come collectively to this concept? Well, today, um, what you typically see is you're kind of beholden to the policy of the service provider uh, because there are you know, relatively few concentrated service providers providing us with the vast majority of our you know, social networks, email, a variety of other things. Um, <clears throat> you often don't have the option to determine your own policies uh, around your privacy or security of your information. Uh, Right, the end user license agreement and a variety of the other things that they provide to you, which you implicitly accept or, or explicitly accept, I guess, if you read them, uh, is you know effectively their policy today uh, around how they're going to treat your information and a variety of other things. And so that's that's a huge problem. I mean, it's it's people have talked for a long time about how do we enable you know parametric policies, how do we have distributed systems that have different policies and things like that. But people have for various societal reasons have accepted the use by and large of these services and then therefore just been forced, the policies have been forced on them. I, I think the policy always feels forced on me in Facebook and it always seems to be changing, constantly changing, I can never keep up with it. Uh, and I change my privacy settings frequently because they seem to revert somehow magically. Uh, and, and that, I think that echoes a previous comment we heard today that we, uh, I'll paraphrase, we willingly surrender our privacy for convenience or quality of service. And uh, it, it may affect 
uh, our definition of us. Is it, is it still acceptable for us to, to surrender our privacy and still be considered the same group? If by surrendering our pri privacy, we are suddenly, somehow sharing some essential part of our identity with an outsider, someone who is not us. It's a, it's a difficult question, and I think it begs the, the, third, the third question. Uh, we first asked, who are we? Who is us? Who is them? Who are we? The second question is, okay, what's expected of us? What do we do? But now the third question is, since there are a lot of us doing a lot of different things, how do we manage it? And David commented yeah. about that. And Karsten, I, I wanted to add something to the question. So I'm coming from Europe. So in Europe, we have a simple code. The data belong to us. We have to give our consent to a third party when a third party wants to use our data. And the third principle is when a third party uses our data, they cannot abuse them. And this code was kind of um, detailed out in GDPR. I personally think GDPR is the best practice policy. It was developed in a very democratic process. So all the Europeans with the representative came up to the conclusion GDPR is a good thing. And I also personally think there are huge challenges to make existing systems GDPR compliant. However, with modern cryptography, it's possible and it will happen very soon that we have such system to enabling this code. The data belong to us and we have to give our consent. Yes, but we don't just have, it's not just our individual, our, what we consider our private information that we're talking about, it's all of our activity. Um, uh, even our activity on our corporate systems, uh, you're sitting in, in uh, Germany or Switzerland or England and you're working on a computer, well, some of your activity is being monitored by your corporation. That's not necessarily covered by data protection direct directives, and, uh, therefore, but it's still part of um, monitoring who you are, what you're doing, and um, and how it's being managed. As we uh, think of this question, I think we had another comment. Yeah, so, so this idea of permanent Europe is very interesting because obviously we, we agree legally to a lot of the things uh, that we allow Facebook and Google and others to do with our data, but I would argue that no reasonable person actually reads those. Uh, I've seen statistics saying that you know all the all the agreements that we agree to in a year would take you know 70 work days to to read through. Um, so we're not giving any informed consent; it's only a legal consent. To what extent is that different in Europe? Um, yeah, I think today we maybe come back to convenience. So people give their consents be, be consent because there's no alternative. However, with modern cryptography, it's possible to build a Facebook, a decentralized Facebook where we control the data, we don't have to even give the consent to a third party, and we can still do social, social network interactions. And as soon as these systems pick up, people have a clear choice. Yeah? Do they want to give um, their data to systems where it's convenient to have social network interactions, or do they, for convenience, just want to give away all the data? I think that's a choice, and um, yeah, the market will... Um, yeah, will play out and we see which of the systems, central, decentral systems, GDPR compliant, um, yeah, will remain. Yeah, so, so I mean, the, the key to that is sort of decentralized power because of the, the issues with respect to, you know, consent, uh, everybody signs these consent things in the, in the case of going to a doctor. You ain't going to see the doctor if uh, you don't sign the, the, the consent form. Uh, so in some applications, perhaps in a Facebook-like application, we'll be able to decentralize power so that there isn't asymmetric power between you and the service provider. It's decentralized, and so that's, that's not going to be an issue. They can't coerce you in the way that, that we are today. But I'm not sure that's going to be the case in all applications. I, th I think also the... I mean, the big question here is policy understanding, right? So it's, it's extremely difficult to read one of these policies and interpret it even as an expert, right? And so you wouldn't truly expect anyone to do it. So what you would like to see in those scenarios is, is, is regulation, right? And then that's what the Europeans have put in place, right? So the, the regulation prohibits certain policies from being written because they would violate it and potentially be you know, criminally liable or, or, or legally liable, right? And so 
at least by there being regulations, that tells you that no policies of a certain sort may exist. Uh, and, and then you have some comfort that what you're signing up for you know, uh, will likely be within a safe subset or, or something like that. And that, that, would, that would certainly be more appealing. Is, uh, is data about our behavior at work um, part of this discussion? Let's say I, uh, I spend a certain number of minutes or keystrokes uh, at my workstation, um, but uh, I, I spend uh, more time walking the halls or something like that. And this, this could be data um, that's collected about me or uh, could be um, uh, uh, information that's relevant for determining whether I'm behaving properly as an employee in a corporation. Um, where does technology help us to help a corporation to, to manage what it ought to manage and not overmanage? You know, every corporation has the possibility of becoming Big Brother, but I, I, I realize that the, the Big Brother, that uh, the closest thing to the Big Brother that uh, George Orwell described or that Aldous Huxley. Uh, uh, hinted at uh, was, is um, the big brother that we're all freely and happily and conveniently participating in, sharing our locations and our personal data and our preferences and our likes and our dislikes. Uh, I just wonder how much of who we are uh, really is um, any particular group's um, right to know. What are your thoughts? Yes. Yes, she's saying in the past we had multiple identities that were siloed from each other, different roles that we played, different hats we wore. Yes? Yes, so now Facebook. Yes, so Facebook, Google, and all the other applications into which we are uh, um, freely and happily sharing our little bits of information are aggregated and normalized and analyzed by some bigger computing powers elsewhere. And so those big systems have the ability to know more about us, uh, arguably, than even we know about ourselves. It's, it's even worse than that. I mean, the ad exchanges will happily share information about you from one, one site that may have no relationship to another site, and they can pool the information into uh, third-party brokers that uh, build profiles of you, uh, which are you know, kind of their global profile of all your behavior, right? So, so these are not even... These are even potentially competing interests who are who are, are then working together uh, to build to build a, a centralized profile of your behaviors, the sites you visit, and a variety of other things. So our our. Our fellow member of the pub conversation here is suggesting that there should be rules uh, or technology limiting the possibility of this sort of aggregation. Oh, we have a question in the back. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we are getting what we pay for. And since we don't pay anything, we get crap. <laughs> right? That, that, that's where we are. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, since there is a cost for everything, th that cost has to be uh, paid for in some other way. And, and that's what we are uh, uh, discovering, right? And, and, and that part is completely out of the individual's control. I mean, the, the, the key would be to have some understanding of your own data's value, right? And which you don't have today, right? So we we have really no other option other than just giving your data in order to get the service, right? But you have no understanding of the, the value of the service you've been provided or the value of the data that you provided, right? And so th that's a, it's a super difficult kind of economic question to say, well, if I use Gmail, I'm giving up certain 
information rights, but you know, what, how much value is there in that? Or you know, if I could pay a certain amount, could I get some protections? Today, you don't really have a lot of those options. I can't pay more money to get more privacy on most platforms today. Yeah, I, I would like to add to give two to technology perspective first with the um, decentral technology, modern cryptography. It's possible that you have full control of your data. If you give your data away, you do it with uh, with um, um, with an objective, and you can even get an incentive back, and you get cryptographic proofs what has been done with your data, and then you get the proper incentive. The second um, perspective I would like to give coming back here is the concept of self-sovereign identity. And that's, that's a fantastic concept uh, because today we have KYC with banks. So in Germany I do KYC with commerce banks and I have to do another KYC with Deutsche Bank, another KYC with Berkeley Bank, whatever it is. And with a self-sovereign identity I do KYC once. I go to the next bank, I deliver a cryptographic proof that I have done KYC already with another bank and this fully automates and streamlines the entire process. In addition, by self-sovereign identity, it's very important. So I just discussed the financial services identity. There's also a social network identity, a gaming identity, a professional identity, a couple of more identities. I have full control. I have just one silo or one kind of vertical for different identities, all kind of aggregated under my own identity and that's, that's super powerful and um, very consistent. I can um, gather reputations, let's say I'm Uber driver, then I get my, my Uber reputation on this technology. I can easily move my reputation from my customers to Lyft and today there's a clear login. This login is exploited by the big companies. They make it shitload of money and the poor Uber driver has nothing. He's locked in, uh, yeah, in this thing. And self-sovereign identity, modern cryptography is solving this problem. This is uh, an excellent discussion. One just, just one moment and then we'll, have, we'll include you all. I want to just summarize us and get us to a wrap-up point. We've been talking about what I sometimes refer to as the natural order of security. It's this natural flow of any group, any society, or any system that first answers the question, who are we? Next answers the question, what is accepted behavior? Who, what do we do? And then, since there are a lot of us doing a lot of things, how do we manage it? That's the three top three A's uh, there that you see on the screen. And then, but it, all of those beg the question of self-reflection. Are we truly the group we think we are? Are we really the individuals we claim to be? Uh, the identities we claim to be? Are we, um, are we, uh, what, what are we actually doing? How are we actually being managed? This is the question that I conveniently call audit because it starts with an A and this way I have the four A's of security. And, uh, uh, and these I think of as the fundamental questions of society. And they happen to be fundamental concepts of security. So here, this discussion we're having about security technology is really a discussion about how any society forms and wrestles with its authentication, authorization, administration, and audit. Uh, comments in the back? Yeah. yeah. Can I? Yeah, so I have a comment. I, I think the security, uh, we've been talking a lot about security, but I think, I think the security issue cannot just be addressed only by security technology itself. Um, the way I look at it, there's before and after. In other words, that, that security has an implication of when the data before it exists are, are out there and then after. I think the one that you talk about in terms of regulations and auditing and all that, those are after effect. So the question here, my view, I think is, if you want to address the security, we have to deploy other technologies such as AI and all that. And then one of the things that I wanted to make comment on and also you know, post to the panel is the alarming fact of fake news, right? So we not only have to authenticate you know, the, the, uh, the person, now we have to authenticate the content and the origin of the content. 
And I think that's a huge issue that if we cannot rely on the source and authenticity of the content, and it's question, you know, it's gonna shock the whole, you know, democracy of the, the society. So on that, I w we've been looking at, you know, my firm and and then you know the company that we're helping with, are you know looking at AI technologies and all that. So I wanted to kind of, you know, pose the question or the kind of open discussion to the panel. What's your thoughts in terms of what other technology can really help going forward to prevent or to help? those new issues in terms of fake news and all that. Excellent. Gentlemen. I think the, the data are coming from somewhere. Let's say they're coming from a microphone or from a camera. And so what modern technology can do, it can deliver a full data audit trail to when the data have already been created. So what was the timestamp when the data have been created uh, to deliver a proof that says data integrity, which means no one has changed tempered with the data, and the data authentically coming from this sensor device. Yeah? So we have a full data audit trail um, that's stored in, in modern systems, and I think this can help to prevent fake news. And maybe also the other concept, which is called the web of trust, which means that um, I have an identity, I have a claim, and other people are validating um, this uh, this claim, um, and this is all kind of wrapped up in the web of trust. I think the web of trust is a very powerful concept and um, can help to do, um, yeah, um, to fight fake news. Um, I, I don't want to be uh, uh, too overly cynical, but if there's a technology out there that could help people to care or to make people care, that would help. <coughs> because part of the problem that we've seen actually in the security field is that it's very difficult to actually secu uh, sell security technology or privacy technology or whatever if it, if it costs the least bit because at the end of the day, people don't seem to care that much. But that also applies to a lot of other things, including some of the things that Max was talking about earlier today. And David, uh, outside of this room, outside of this, <laughs> you know, esteemed group of uh, enlightened people here. Uh, everyone else in the world thinks security is an annoying layer of cost and inconvenience. You say, oh, you need more security. And what they just heard you say is you need more annoying layers of cost and inconvenience. And so we run the risk, if we talk about security, of uh, turning people off. I, I still want to bring us back to talking about driving fast. It seems to me that all the discussion we've just had about answering the question who we are, um, managing uh, uh, what's expected of us, forming groups with the answers of these questions, these are all ways of having agility and adapting in society. Um, and I, I'd like for us, we're out of time now, but I'd like for all of us to reflect on the role of security technology, not just to solve system challenges with applications or with social networks, but to address and help to define what makes a good society in the first place. Who we are, what do we do, how do we manage it, and is it working? Thank you very much. <laughs>